What if I told you that the number one thing holding you back? No, it's not this economy. That's not even inflation. It's not even your skill set. So what is it? It's your stinking thinking. That's right. I'm talking about limiting beliefs. Now, limiting beliefs appear as rational excuses. It sounds legitimate. Sounds good. Sounds very logical. Why you wouldn't do something. And so many things come up in justifying logically why you should not make a decision to move forward and take action. And therefore, some of the biggest goals that you desire and looking to smash and accomplish are never done. By you watching this episode, is you and I are gonna go through a process. We're gonna go through a formula of how you can smash these limiting beliefs, your limiting beliefs, so therefore you can live the life and business that you've been envisioning and praying for. And I have a free PDF here at the end of this episode, so therefore you can use it as a reference. All right, ready to go? Three, two, one, let's go. Let's get this money. So let's define limiting beliefs. Here we go. Living beliefs are negative thoughts that prevent you from taking action. They often manifest as rational excuses that justify inaction. So what's the impact? The impact is that limiting beliefs keep you comfortable but hinder your growth and success. The last 30 days, we hosted our annual convention in Las Vegas, and we've been through many conferences and many follow-up meetings in between, and we're coaching people to get to the next level. We're masterminding, we're mentoring, we're helping people process their business. They run $10 million companies, $20 million companies, $30 million companies, and everybody's in between getting started. The $100,000 companies, $500,000 companies, $1 million companies. Everybody has a limiting belief at different levels of their growth. And oftentimes, these limiting beliefs get them all caught up. I'll give you an example. God told me not to do this. Or God told me that this isn't, I just felt that check in the spirit. Matt, people aren't buying Matt, people aren't picking up the phone. Matt, people just aren't getting back to me. Matt, in my city, in my state, people don't think this way. They don't act this way. People don't want to invest in their businesses or people want to invest in their families this way. Or worse, nobody in my family thinks I'm doing the right thing. Nobody in my family thinks I'm on the right path of financial freedom and prosperity that you told me, Matt, we could enjoy. Matt, you understand, I'm really not good at sales. I never really had to sell anything. I mean, I've done other things, but I'm just not really good at selling. Now... At face value, these reactions and these words sound very logical. And I would actually say, you know what? If God told you to do this or nobody's buying, you're in family things, and you're going opposite of the grain, they sound very logical for you to stop and not do it. Let me pause real quick and ask you who are watching this, what's some of the limiting beliefs that you've either gone through and passed through and blasted through? So what was I thinking about? That was nothing because I'm on the other side of that limiting belief. How many of you would agree that you've been through some limiting beliefs every seven and you've accomplished it, you've busted down that wall, please put that one limiting belief or two limiting beliefs or three limiting beliefs that you've demolished and put in the comment section. We'd love to read them. Or the opposite. Is there a limiting belief that you can't seem to process through and get over right now? Please, if you care and bold enough and courageous enough to share, please put it in the comment section below too as well. So why do limiting beliefs even show up to begin with? Well, Matt, you know, I, I got this brain, this mind, this vision. I, I see it, I feel it, but I just don't do anything about it. Well, welcome to the, no, 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 not the twilight zone. Welcome to the comfort zone. Let me explain what a comfort zone is. The brain is wired to avoid discomfort, staying in the comfort zone. In one of my favorite books, the big book, the Bible, says in Matthew 26, that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And here's why, big goals, trigger fear. Big goals trigger uncertainty. Big goals trigger inadequacy. Big goals trigger lack of bandwidth and incapacity. And when you're doing this mental self-assessment of this big goal, like, I don't know, the people that I have to accomplish this big goal aren't here yet, or the financial resource for me to accomplish this big goal, I don't haven't acquired it yet, or the sales I need to build my company I haven't made yet. Man, let me just reduce these beliefs and goals and let me limit my expectations of my life. Well, welcome to growing. Welcome to evolving. Back in the same big book called the Bible, even in Hebrews, it says, let's go on and press on to spiritual maturity. By the way, how easy is it to physically mature? You ain't got to do nothing to physically mature, do you? You just grow up. You, your face changes, your body changes, you start having hair growth in places never thought that you'd grow up, right? You mature, and you mature as an adolescent into an adult. But from an entrepreneurial standpoint, there's also an area of emotional, spiritual, mental maturity to accomplish the bigger, bigger goals 
that we set for ourselves. So therefore, the people around us, people that we employ, our customers, our vendors, the people that we engage in business are blessed. People that we work with are enriched because of our obedience to our blessings, our goals, our gifts, and also execution of the game plan to get us to accomplish those bigger goals. So let me share with you two zones. There's a comfort zone and there's a growth zone. Everything you want in life is not in the comfort zone. Everything that you want to accomplish in life is in the growth zone. In other words, you have to get out of your comfort zone into the growth zone to experience the things that you've been praying and hoping and believing in. In this process, on this bridge, going from the comfort zone to the growth zone, this bridge is going through an abyss. And through this abyss, you'll experience fear. You'll experience loneliness. You will experience potential regret. Am I doing the right thing? You'll be experiencing, potentially, the point of no return or the point I get to get back. Whichever you choose at that moment will define you. You'll say things like, I don't have the right education. I don't have any experience. I don't have the right skill set. I don't have the money. These are all protective measurements that we take going through this abyss. But it's not the truth. So what about the classic example of, I'm too busy. I ain't got the time for this. I got so much on my plate. This is a classic example of you slipping into the limiting belief zone and actually making it rational. And it seems logical, right? There's only so many hours in a day. I, I can't add another thing to my plate. But uh, hey, fellas, let me talk to you real quick. <laughs> Remember the time when you were dating your girl before you dating your wife? And she called you at midnight, one o'clock. Babe, I'm lonely. Can you come by and keep me company? What'd you do, bro? What'd you do? Say, I'm too, I'm too sleepy. I'm not coming. Bro, you know you got right out of them pajamas, right into your flip-flops, and you hightailed over there. You got there. Speed record time. In other words, in other words, you make time for things that you value. You make time for things that you know will be either pleasing or helping you avoid pain. But when we find ourselves in this rational mode, this comfort zone mode, we're going to go into it. And by the way, many of you, you know, you, you, those are funny experiences when we were dating. Now, many of you are married to that woman and you make time for her. You make time for your kids. You make time for your business. You always make time for things that you value. See, that's what the maturity, that's pressing onto maturity, going through that abyss of going from the comfort zone into the growth zone. You say, you know what? If it's for the betterment of my family, I will do this. And nothing is going to stop me from improving the quality of life for my employees, my staff, my family, the people I love and care about, and anybody that's around me, I will do this because it's my responsibility with God-given talents to do something about it. It wasn't placed on my lap. This divine appointment didn't end up in my door because it was just a mistake. Because my God, don't make mistakes. I don't know if you believe that. By the way, do you believe that? God, don't make no mistakes. Put that in the comment section below. I believe in divine appointments. There's a reason why certain situations happen in your life. It's called my burning bush moment. Like, I don't know why certain things happen, don't happen. But I take a step back. Okay, Lord, what's going on here? What am I supposed to press on through? What am I supposed to be acting in maturity about? And by the way, I just want to let you guys know, there's a large part of my life I'm very childlike. I still enjoy a lot of things in life. I'm very goofy. I like playing prank jokes. But when it comes to money, my responsibilities, my role as a father, my role as a CEO of my company, I take, I take those things very seriously. And by the way, let me add on a little bit of history of my experience. Guess who my entire life? I've never seen make excuses that they have time or the money. You know what I believe? In those time excuses and those money excuses, by the way, it's hurtful for me to say this because I have family members and people that I grew up with stuck in this, but people that never make excuses about time and money are who? Addicts, drug addicts, alcoholics, gamblers. You know what? These people, I grew up my life in the streets of Chicago. I grew up with my neighborhood in Chicago, family members I knew. Sadly, they were addicted on some other outside substance to get them through their troubling moments to you know find out a way that can cope with going on in life. Guess what they never complained about? They never complained about lacking time to do their thing. They never lacked about never having enough money to do their thing. They found money to do drugs. They found money to buy alcohol. They found money to go gamble and many other things. And by the way, every one of us, every one of us has some form of addiction. It's just what we are addicted to and how we challenge it and how we express that. But you know, I've never heard them say, I don't have no time to do my drugs. I have no time to do my alcohol and drink. I have no time to, uh, you know, they always find time. And guess what? They always find the money. They're very resourceful. Addicts are very resourceful. You know why? They're so locked in to getting their fix. So are you telling me you watching this right now are being out hustled, out maneuvered, out strategized by an addict, by a drug addict, 
by a coke addict, by an alcoholic. By the way, it's, again, I'm not saying this for any fun at all, but they don't ever seem to give me any excuses. But people are raising families. People that have to expand their businesses slip into rational excuses why they can't do something. What? And I hope that this is a come to Jesus moment for many of you, that this situation that is presented before you've been giving these, you've been given these gifts, this moment of growth, and many of you are choosing fear. Many are choosing limiting beliefs. You don't think you were called to be the head, and now you're acting like the tail? You're meant and born and given opportunities to grow it. There's a stewardship responsibility with what you begin, whether it's time, talent, resources, opportunities, access, you got it. What are you doing about it? So let's break down a couple case studies. Henry Ford. Henry Ford was told by his employees, there's no such way we can invent a V8 engine. There's no way you could put it on one block. His engineers, some of the smartest people in the world said it couldn't get done, Henry. Ain't gonna get done. Classic limiting belief. Guess what Ford did? Guess what Henry Ford did? He still pushed through. He found a way. He, he, by the way, he's not an engineer. He had a vision. And he kept saying, listen, the same way we built here, the same way to face a problem and find ways to maneuver around it, we got to find a way. And what was the result? A revolutionary product called the V8 engine. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is don't let experts or even your past failures, lack of success in the past, keep you and define for what's possible. You know, Patrick but David just awarded us, we we're in Las Vegas a few weeks ago for our annual convention. Pulls 20 of us to the side, private lunch in Vegas before our annual convention begins. And he awarded us because we went through an exit. A couple of years ago, we had an exit here, nearly $300 million exit of our company right here downtown Dallas with Integrity Marketing Group. And uh, there's a nice big fat exit. The world knows about it. Our industry knows about it. And it's a very, very, very well put together process of Guff's going from a company of 66 agents to selling a company at that time of 25,000 agents. Since then, by the way, since acquisition two years ago, we've nearly doubled the company. So most companies, when they get acquired, uh, kind of chill out, cool out here. No, for us, full steam ahead. We doubled the company since acquisition. And how do we do that? No limiting beliefs. Things that we are potentially afraid of, hey man, we can do this. Confident in our skills. Be confident in our leadership. Be confident in our Father in heaven to guide us and lead us the right way, to bless us with the wisdom necessary to take our comfort from this level to this level, this level to this level. Deeper faith, deeper access to wisdom, greater coachability and accountability. That's the cool part about this whole growth process. Growth process. The second case that here is Colonel Sanders. I love referencing Colonel Sanders a lot. A lot of people think, man, I'm too old or I'm too young to start a business. This case with Colonel Sanders, too old. He was 65 years old when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. He says, you know what? I got this only value of asset that I have, which is a great chicken recipe. If you ever Googled uh, Colonel Sanders' story, he'd sell his chicken at these diners off these uh, gas stations where people go travel in the South and sell them chicken. And people loved the chicken. He had a very good chicken recipe. And when he retired, he got the social security check of a couple hundred bucks. He's like, no, no, I'm not living on social security with just a couple hundred bucks. I'm not living my life this way. He would make a long story short, thousands, nearly a thousand no's, 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 no's kept coming his way about his chicken recipe. Well, guess what he still did? He still pressed on, still moved forward because he had faith. By the way, he is not a believer. Colonel Sanders, before this process, was not a believer. He wasn't a church-going, Bible-banging, believing in Christ, CEO, chicken recipe-having Colonel Sanders. He was just a dude that refused to live on a couple hundred dollars of Social Security on a monthly basis. And he did something about it. Instead of complaining, I don't have the resources, he accessed something like, you know, what do I have in my hands? I do have a resource. That resource is a great chicken recipe. And you guys know the story. By the way, I think uh, 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 right down here in, in, in Plano, there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken headquarters right here of a legacy and headquarters drive here in, in Plano, Texas. Which, by the way, side note, it was only until he was 75 years old that Colonel Sanders gave his life to Christ. That's right. You thought this good old boy from the South never believed in a father and ever creator? No, it wasn't until 75 years old that he took the beloved prayer to give his life to Christ. And what did God do to his business? Bow, bow, expand And to this day, it's still in business. And when, when I'm looking at this type of stuff, do you want to build a business and your finances, your sales team to live long, way long after you are? Do you want your business to be a legacy type of company that creates generational wealth long after you're here? 
Do you want your finances, your resources to last your family generation, by generation, by generation? Our guys are reading a couple books this month, actually three books, but I'll, I'll mention these two books here. We're reading the, the 38 letters that John D. Rockefeller wrote to his son. And then I, as I was, I was ordering that book, you know, Amazon has these uh, suggested things. Not the opposite of that was Vanderbilt. Because Vanderbilt, before Rockefeller came about, if you ever watched the series, The Men Who Built America, the richest man in the world was Commodore Vanderbilt. It's the Commodore. He, the reason why they called him Commodore because he was commanding steamboats to create trade with inside the Americas, right? To go from the East Coast, West, using steamboats. He created commerce. People needed his boats to move the products and the people from the East Coast, from the coastal shores, the coastal states, inland. He made a lot of money doing that until one day he says, you know what? I don't think that's the future anymore. Hey, fam, I'm selling the steamboat business and I'm going into the railroad business. What? Anyway, that multiplied his wealth even more. Even though everybody in his family thought he was crazy. Everybody's family thought he was nuts. But what do you do? You create the greatest railroad system in America. You establish this whole thing. Greatest wealth in America. Richest man in America at that time. Massive amounts of wealth. Matter of fact, Central University in Tennessee is now called Vanderbilt University because of honoring him. But when you look at, sadly, the book Vanderbilt, what has happened is the fortune he created in his generation, three, four generations after, it's been destroyed. Matter of fact, who wrote this book? Vanderbilt? Talk about the family wealth, the family fortune that lost it all, is a descendant of the Vanderbilt. His name? Anderson Cooper. His mother? Gloria Vanderbilt. And even in the book, Gloria Vanderbilt said, son, listen, you might hear about this tremendous wealth that this last name used to carry, but you got to know, there ain't no wealth for you to have. There's nothing in the trust fund. My brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, our aunts and uncles, they all blew through the money that Commodore Vanderbilt created in his generation. And son, you got to get a job just like everybody else now. It's Anderson Cooper. But the flip side to that is the... Rockefeller family, which the Rockefeller family to this day, five, six, going on seven generations deep now, are receiving money from the original trust fund that John D. Rockefeller set up in the early 1900s. Why? Because he created systems and process to protect the limiting beliefs and the greed beliefs of being a human being. One anticipated it, which is uh, Vanderbilt, and protected the money to pass on from generation to generation. By the way, I've met a gentleman named Mark Rockefeller. He's in the financial services industry. I said, by chance, are you related? He goes, yeah, I'm related, but we're not part of the rich side of the family. We got disinherited from the family wealth. Wow. So he's telling me, Mark, by the way, if you're watching, I'd love to reconnect with you. But Mark Rockefeller is part of the lineage of the Rockefeller that got disinherited from the family's wealth because of somebody, what somebody did with limiting beliefs two, three generations before him. So there's a benefit to being aligned with smashing through limiting beliefs because then your family and the people you love and care about are blessed not only for your generation but for multiple generations deep you think what you do today just affects you it doesn't it affects a lot of the responsibilities and all the people that are around you that you recruit to work for your company they recruit as vendors they recruit as, as as customers they're affected by your obedience to your blessings your business your decisions and smashing through your limiting beliefs let's take a look at some of these videos here of, of takes on overcoming limiting beliefs. Let's take a look at this first video here. I believe this first video here was, uh, is uh, Alex Shamozzi. There's three things that limit us, right? It's our skills, it's our character traits, and our beliefs. And we have deficiencies in each of these. And the difficulty is knowing which one is the biggest deficit at this particular moment. In my opinion, the hardest one is beliefs because my favorite quote from Orson Scott Card is, uh, we question all of our beliefs except for those that we truly believe and those we never think to question. Because if you really believe something, you never think to question it. Yeah, I also add on to this as well is, if you thought you were doing something right, then later found out it was wrong, when would you want to know? And the follow-up question to that is, if you finally found out that something you believe now is wrong, the better question is, what are you going to do about it? And when? And so if you believe that throughout your life you've been told certain things and later find it was wrong, I know it's a shock factor, right? It was real, wow, I realized that through my living with, for example, the first living belief I recognize walking my faith is that the pastor isn't the one responsible for reading your Bible. You, I, we're supposed to be the ones responsible for reading our Bible. We're not supposed to just let the pastor pray for our family. Me, as a man, I'm supposed to pray for my family, to pray for my home, to pray for my school. Matter of fact, just this last Thursday, 
my wife uh, reminded me that uh, we had prayer for the kids. Uh, so we went on Thursday morning. We walked the football field and we prayed on the football field before the season began, before the first game. Then we walked into the locker room. We prayed for our children. We prayed for our son. We prayed for those who put on this helmet to play this dangerous game, this exciting game, this blessing from God game. I love football. But it's also a dangerous game to pray for injury proof, to pray for the conversation that happened in that locker room. I know how teenage boys are. I used to be that teenage boy. I still remember what it's like to bless our thoughts, the conversations, the exchange and dialogue. Pray for all that. Doesn't mean that some pastor is responsible for to do that. There's a pastor supposed to pray for your home. No, you, the man, you're supposed to be praying for your home. That was the first thing we believe I learned to destroy and grew through and pressed onto maturity in to not defer other people to outsource the faith life, the prayer life that I'm supposed to be leading. And when I don't defer those things, guess what? That translates into other things in my business, in my health, in my parenting, in my relationship with my friends, that I learned to lead, not just follow. See, that's what you're called to do, CEO. This is what you're called to do, sales leader, is you're called to lead. If you find yourself frustrated, ask yourself this question. Honestly, what is on the other side of this limiting belief. If I see a limiting belief, what is on the other side of me saying, I don't got it, I ain't got the money, I ain't got the resource, I ain't got the people. And there's a frustrating moment that goes through that, but that's a frustrating moment you gotta keep pressing through. So let's take a look at this next video. If I give you one message no. to hold in your hearts today, it's this, never ever give up. Mm -hmm. There'll be times in your life, you'll wanna quit, you'll wanna go home, just never quit. I've seen so many brilliant people they gave up in life they were totally brilliant they were top of their class they were the best students they were the best of everything they gave up i've seen others who really didn't have that talent or that ability and they're among the most successful people today in the world because they never quit and they never gave up so just remember that never stop fighting for what you believe in and for the people who care about you you know, one of the things that I've seen throughout my career is I, I, I'm, I'm Filipino, right? So I like taking pictures just for taking pictures. But I realized me taking those pictures, I also keeping receipts. So I remember my first journey in 2015 with PHB Agency. We came on board here with, uh, with 27 agents. I can't tell you, man, how sad it is for me sometimes to see of those 27 original agents that came to PHB Agency with the start of, to start our, our movement, which is the Money Smart Movement team, that very small percentage of those people are still with me today. But along the way, I've picked up many other people who are attracted to what I'm doing. But the original people that I started off with, sadly, they've branched off and done other things or didn't do things because I can't see that their life eight, nine years later has radically changed since eight, nine years ago. Now, I can say this about myself, my wife, my family, my children, my mother, my father, my wife's mother and father. Their life has radically changed in the last eight and a half going on nine years now because our decision to blast through living beliefs. And when we blast through our own limiting beliefs, guess what? We give permission for other people that are with us. We give them permission, consciously or subconsciously, to blast through their limiting beliefs too as well. I'm reminded of this movie, Coach Carter. And his coach taking over this basketball program for this inner city kids who are unruly, not listening, obviously had through some limiting beliefs. These children had these limiting beliefs of what they could get accomplished because they were raised in inner city. Maybe there was a lack of involvement for the parents or their parents were sharing them the wrong examples in life, but they never felt that they could win. And Coach Carr kept telling them, what's your greatest fear? What's your greatest fear? Coach, what are you talking about? What's your greatest fear? What you, Coach, what are you talking about? The whole entire movie, go watch it, Coach Carter. And then... The kid figures out that this is referencing a poem. What is your greatest fear? And he nails it. And he tells his coach in a moment of triumph, in a moment of blasting through limiting beliefs, he says to a coach, what is your greatest fear? Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frighten us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's just not in some of us, it's in everyone. And it's when we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Woo! I'm fired up about reading that one. And if you find yourself in a predicament 
What is your deepest fear? What is your greatest fear? What are you afraid? Boom, reread this. You're more powerful beyond measure. Now, it doesn't sound logical. And the reason I bring up what Patrick did with us in terms of this exit is because he gave us a deal toy, which represents the deal that was never supposed to happen to an Iranian refugee, escaped to Germany for two years, came to America to live in L.A. to join the army, to get introduced to financial services on 9-10-2001, a day before 9-11, to Morgan Stanley, and then leaves that to start the insurance industry from 2002 to 2009. 2009 starts PHB agency. And next thing you know, 14, 15 years later, $300 million, nearly a $300 million exit. What's that called? You know what that call is? It's called beating down your deepest fear and doing the impossible. In fact, that's what he named the deal toy. We did the impossible. Are you willing to do the impossible? Some of you said, man, I'd love to make a million dollars, but nobody in my family's ever made a million dollars. Guess what you're setting out to do? You're willing to do the impossible. You're willing to be debt-free. You're willing to scale a company from a $1 million company to a $10 million company to a $20 million company to a $40 million, $100 million, $1 billion company. Matter of fact, you even just saying that scares you. Get used to it because you're about to accomplish it. Eventually, if you're willing to get this behavior, this muscle, this spiritual, this emotional, this mental muscle to continue to dominate and blast through the limiting beliefs. So what's the process? How do you identify your limiting beliefs? Let me just share a few things. The three-step process. Number one, you've got to identify. You gotta recognize what limiting beliefs are holding you back. Is it money? Is it time? Is it resources? What is actually holding you back? The easiest way, you guys are raised with this. I can't do something. We ain't got no money for that. We ain't got it. And some of you said, well, if it's cheaper, if I do it all by myself, right? So the opposite of recognizing your limiting beliefs is listen to the excuses you actually give yourself when those limiting beliefs come up. Listen to the excuses you give yourself when you don't hit those goals. There's a goal that we're uh, needing to hit. By the way, I fall short of my goals all the time. Um, the challenge too, I would say with goal setting, is that goals, sometimes for most people, they set them so low to not let themselves down and they hit those goals, but they're really uninspired. Like, yeah, I know I could hit that goal. The thing with goals is to set a goal a little further than what you can reach because that's gonna cause you to stretch. And what causes you to stretch, you get more uncomfortable, you get more uncomfortable, you get more uncomfortable, you stretch, you're more uncomfortable, and this, you know, bam, I hit it. And when you hit it, wow. Oh. The thing too is, well, is what's your reward? for hitting those limiting beliefs. What's your reward to yourself? You ought to give yourself a prize. At the same time as well, is if you don't hit that goal, you ought to give yourself a punishment. <laughs> People want to hear that. You ought to give yourself a punishment because you, we learn at times not only through opportunities, but we also learn through pain of not hurting certain goals, not hitting certain goals. The challenge is to question the truth of these beliefs. Why do you believe that you can't become a millionaire? Why can't you believe that you can build a $50 million company? Why can't you believe you can build a $100 million company? Why can't you believe you can build a sales team of 100 people? Why can't you believe that I need a big business and a big team to equate the accomplishment and the vision I need to set forward to hit these certain goals? A lot of people do one of two things. They believe in that greater goal of building a bigger company. And what they have to do along that process is to create deeper systems and processes so therefore they can accomplish goals. They need to create different department heads, they start with directors, and they improve the VPs, and they, they, they have to build it and require and have a C-suite type of talent skill set to run these departments and the bigger that business grows. And for some people, that scares them. Budget-wise, time-wise, I don't know how to lead people because I, I don't have a college, for example, I, have a, I don't have a college degree. I have a 2.2 GBA in high school, but how come I'm building a $40 million top-line revenue company? How come when I was part of a $300 million exit building my part with inside the company, I was able to see the process and experience all that and be part of these uh, meetings to sell the company as a chief distribution officer of the company at one point. So I learned through that process by smashing those limiting beliefs and more so anchoring and linking onto somebody who's also smashing those limiting beliefs too as well. And that'd be for me, Patrick but David. I was able to write Shadi to see what he was doing play my part, play my role inside those meetings, to be coached up by Tom Ellsworth. We call him Three Comma Tommy because he built three different companies at that time with an exit of over $1.1 billion. And now it's $1.4 billion. It was his fourth company. But Tom Ellsworth is coaching me how to talk to investors, potential people that's going to buy our company because they want to get to the brass tacks. They want to get to the numbers. They don't care about the vision, the mission, the crusade, the heart and the energy bond. They want to know, does it make money? And can they make money if they buy and acquire a company? So I learned a lot of those by latching on 
to the right people. Now I'm taking this company out from a $300 million company. Now we're taking it to a $8 billion company and then to a $5 billion company and to a $10 billion company. Why? Because I know now the process of smashing those limiting beliefs. So question for you is, have you identified people you can latch on with to as well to smash those limiting beliefs so therefore you see clearer to those issues and through those issues? Do you? And have you shifted your mindset from impossible to I am possible? Because you know the word impossible says I am possible. Even in the word impossible, can I deny you? So inside the word impossible, that's an opportunity for you to say, you know what, God, work to me and through me. I want to see you work, God. And God says, well, great. I want to see you work too as well. And imagine this partnership that you have with your faith to march forward. Now, I'm just saying it's a smooth road. I'm not seeing that it's a uh, uh, unicorns and rainbows and roses. No, it's not. The place. It's up, down, up, down, and a lot of wrestling and fighting and conflict in between. But through that process, you mature. Through that process, you understand how to handle this pressure, how to handle that stress. And that's an amazing position to be in. So number one, you got to identify. Second one, you've got to replace. Replacing limiting beliefs with empowering ones. And you got to focus on solutions, not excuses. By the way, it's very easy to complain, complain, complain. By the way, it's such a low energy, easy thing to do. Complain, I don't have it, da 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 Versus being resourceful. I remember reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert, uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki said, you know, most people say, I can't afford it. Wealthy people say, how can I afford it? One causes your brain to think, the other one process causes your brain to shut down. What do you want to do with your life? You want to shut down when you hit conflict? When you have limiting thoughts and beliefs and resources? Because I believe you and I are in a country and serve a world and I serve a God with unlimited resources. We just haven't learned how to tap into it. We haven't leveled up our skill set to tap into it. We haven't le leveled up our capacity, our network to approach that, to acquire that. That's all it is. We just got to get better. We just got to ask for further and further wisdom and guidance and the courage to take action. So as I wrap up, just keep this in mind. Limiting beliefs are invisible chains that hold us back, that hold you back, that hold you back from the greater next best version of you. They appear as rational reasons why you shouldn't do something, but that's the smoke screen. And that's a smoke screen that could be diminished or removed with the right way of thinking. And I encourage you, if you can change the way you see things, right? Or more importantly, change the way you think things, change the way you see things. And the moment you change the way you see things is the difference in how you do things. And how you change the way you do things creates different results in your life. And guess what these results do? They improve and encourage and deepen and strengthen the way you think. By the way, that can happen in a very good way or sadly can happen in a very bad way. Your choice. What do you want to do with your decisions? What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your business? Do you want to, do you want to process it with a negative way of thinking, limiting thinking, or an unlimited thinking? I pray the opposite. And by the way, guess what's easier to do? Guess what's easier to do? The easier way to do is to be sucked in by limiting beliefs. Entitlement, resources, complain, blame, self-pity, the whole bit. It's so, so unattractive to talk to people that, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I don't have this. Like you're helpless. You're not helpless. You're a man. You're a woman. You're an adult. You're a leader. Remember that. And you have a faith. You have a big man upstairs that wants everything to come your way, your direction. And all he wants to do is bless you, incorporate his thoughts and his spirit into what you're doing. If you ask for it, incorporate the processes necessary to get you to the next level. But you gotta be asking yourself this deeper quality question and being able to be vulnerable to yourself and understand that most things in your life are on the opposite side of your pride and ego. And one last thought. You're only one decisive decision away from taking action that changes your life forever. That's it, that's all it takes. So if you want to get a recap, if you want to get a PDF of this, please comment in the section below or click the link in the description too as well. I'm encouraged by you too as well. What's your takeaway? What's your improvement or what's your input into what we have in terms of encouraging and blasting through your limitless? What has worked for you? We want to know here too as well. We'll put in a follow-up reel because I'm looking forward to how many of you are accomplishing things because once you accomplish overcoming, smashing that process of living beliefs, everything in the world just becomes, oh, I got that, I got it. All that matters now is just time, energy, experience for you to eventually accomplish your goals. Now, that eventually could be six months, or that eventually could be six years, it depends on how broad that goal is or 
how much work you're willing to put in to accomplish that. So that being said, guys, I appreciate your time, your attention. I appreciate you watching this episode. Please uh, put your biggest takeaways. You agree with me? You don't agree? Please make sure you subscribe, hit like, and share this with your other entrepreneurs in your life today. With that being said, God bless you guys. Till we meet again. Continue to smart. Continue to smart. And be money smart today. Mm-hmm.